What's up, y'all? It's your boy Steve-O, a.k.a. Mr. Make You Famous. We bring in the world an infinite recording story. Everybody, be, everybody remember Mukuku Cow in my projects back in 2000, one of the biggest singles. And uh, everybody went on a story about the whole situation, how the label fell, how the label came up, what happened to the artist, somebody with so much charisma that took off to the top, just disappeared from the game. And uh, I think it's time to tell the story now. It's about 14 years, and I want to share the story with the world. Because you understand that in my projects was a single that was on the billboard for several weeks, seven weeks straight. That was a lot of hot songs for a lot of hot artists, but a lot of people don't make the billboard at number one in this whole game. That's some stuff like what Michael Jackson do. So that's history. So I'm going to bring it to y'all, man. Cal, why are you so lazy? You were supposed to win the gun and pick that up for me two hours ago. Damn, you don't do nothing for me. Dog, my projects is sweet, but if you ain't from where I'm from, like some dog don't come or you getting beaten. Yeah, we cheating, dog, that's automatic. We green, plus we trying to beat the needy dog with all the cash. Steal from the rich and give to the poor. We sell a few drugs, and bust a few slugs, and pimp a few hoes. Don't let us find a dick and higgity. Dog, we turn them into spigotties. We're shorties off and riggedy. So if you ain't from here, I'm with my guys. Don't even roll through the play, cause all the traffic getting minimized. Cries for help, cause you got carjacked. Niggas will roll for a minute, then pass it to the hypes to sell a car back. And once you get it, it'll be stripped down. Thugs, then got your sister man, your dubs, and want your crib now. Y'all better get it in respect, cause I pay to play for a day up in my projects. I just want you to tell them a little bit about you know how you first hooked up with uh, 
do it to death with her eyes and other like bad situation how y'all first came about to, to like form y'all for friendship. How y'all first hooked up back in the Madison school days. Man, it started way back in the early nineties, like ninety one, ninety two. Man, we used to well, I used to always just be making beats anyway. I was making beats back then. I didn't used to go to Madison. I, then I, I used to go to Tech. Then I went to Madison because I heard them be jumping in Madison High School. So I went up there, man, and I became a man up there, though. You know, I was already the man, you know. And I hooked up with Do It To Death, you know, Eyes No, you know, they was already my homies. So then after that, you know, it was on the cracking, you know, we started. You know, doing little talent shows here and there. You know, you know. Tell me about the first time eyes know that I like, introduced uh, brought take to you. Brought take to you. Let me see. My eyes know they introduced me to uh, do it to death. Cause do it to death was looking for a producer at the time. You know, I was I was a little young skinny dude back then. So uh, I see eyes kind of like uh kind of like food Dante, cause you know, cause Dante thought I was kind of crazy, you know, cause I'd be looking crazy sometimes, you know, back then I had a high top fade and shit, and um, and, and Oz Nola said, said to Dante, he said, uh, he said, man, man, whatever you do, just don't ask him his real name, don't ask him his real name, man, and Dante was like, why, why, man, just don't ask him his real name, man, dude, just get real crazy if you ask him his real name. So it was, anyway, they came over for a session, do it to death, and I was another. But at the end of the session, uh, uh, do it to death. He couldn't. He couldn't hold back. He couldn't. He couldn't help himself. He had to find out my real name. So he said, "Like man, I just gotta ask you one more question, man, before I leave, man." He said, "Uh, he said, man, what's your real name?" And I was another said, "No, you know, <laughs> it, was just, it was just a joke." And like, man, because he thought I was going to act crazy and shit. But anyway, yeah, that's that. So, like, when you and Tay hooked up, you know, from uh, the Y, I believe that was the Y equals self days. Take a little bit to that situation, you know, how, how you first started doing music shows. And man, Y equals self, boy. That was a long time ago, boy. Woo! Boy, make me feel old. But anyway, that was our skinny days. You know, we big men, grown uncles and granddaddies now, but, you know. Back then, though, you know, that that was a fun time, man. That was a fun time of doing music, and, and it was some it was some serious shit that that went on with White and stuff too, on another side, you know what I'm saying? But man, it was just that was just a fun time to do music, and and um, I know y'all ain't up with a twine, and. Uh, that's the serious shit I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. So it, was, it was a situation there. It was a real serious situation that went on that time, man. It was I can't uh, expose people, but you know, it was some shit that went that went down with do the death and twine. That's another story. You know what I'm saying? That's another episode too. I ain't even going there, you know. What I'm so after that y'all hooked up with the uh I the guy. Uh, that was nice. After that, we hooked up with uh, Steve-O. Hank, <laughs> shout out to my boy Hank. Um, first time I met Hank, we all, uh, a lot of the artists that came out of Milwaukee back then, um, Ice Moan, um, Oz Nola, Hank, um, a lot of those cats came out of Madison High School. We all went to Madison High School. And it was actually my boy Oz Nola. Um, Hank was Oz Nola's uh, beat maker. And at the time, I didn't have nobody doing beats for me. And um, Oz was like, man, Oz came to school and played a tape for me. And I heard, I heard the beat. And I was, he was like, I'm going to introduce you to my man Hank. Funny story, I remember we was, we was walking from school, walking down to Hank house. And Hank was like, uh... Oz was telling me the whole time that Hank was crazy, and um, he said, he said, whatever you do, don't ask him his real name, uh, you know, so we get to Hank house, and the first thing I do, I say, what's your real name, and Oz screamed out, no, and um, anyway, we all laughed about it, because Oz made me believe Hank was crazy, and Hank was kind of, Hank, you are kind of crazy, but Oz, uh, 
that's how me and Hank uh, hooked up. And um, Hank did a little track for me. And I went back to school. I had my little tape. And I, I took it back to Madison High School. And we played it on the PA system over the speakers in the morning time. You know what I'm saying? So that's how me and Hank started doing music. We was just kids. We had to be like about 16 or 17 years old. And um, we just been good friends and, and comrades and brothers ever since. Making an infinite recording is a long story that I I'm really not gonna go into the into the whole the whole of the story, but I, I can tell you I remember infinite recording started um, kinda out of necessity because you know nobody wanted to give us a shot to do our music. Um, nobody wanted to help us out. So it kinda came out of a necessity. Um, I was doing music um, before and the, the, to be keep it real, I'm, I'm not getting, I'm not gonna throw nobody under the bus. I'm a, but you know, like the guy that was, that was, that was kind of behind me, you know, financially at the time or whatever. Um, you know, he kept pulling in and out, kept pulling in and out, and um, and so we kind of broke, we kind of broke ties and everything like that. And um, my cousin Steve-O was like. Um, Man, do your music, do your music. I'm gonna support you in doing your music. So me, Steve, and Hank, we're sitting in Hank, uh, uh, Hank living room. Hank stayed on 44th, 44th and uh, Lloyd, and we was in Hank living room, and um, and it was like, well, what are we gonna call the record label? And you know, and um, and I just said we're gonna call it Infinite Recordings. And um, and we start, you know, like like you know, I'm not tooting my own horn or nothing, but. That was my thing, like to just, you know, come up with the, come up with ideas and everything like that, you know. So I remember coming up with the logo and everything like that, and just just bringing it together and saying, okay, this is what it's gonna be. And Infinite Recordings really started with just me, Hank, and Steve, me, Hank, and Steve, and um, it kind of metamorphosized and grew from there. But um, but that was the start of the label. That's how everything started. It started in, in Hank living room on 44th and Lloyd. Um, me, Hank, and Steve, and you know, and I just came up with the name Infinite Recorders, and we started the ball rolling. And I mean, since then, you know, you know, we kind of ownership changed hands and all that kind of stuff. But it's like it's, it's it's what the name the name Infinite meant so much, um, and it still means much because it was not just about a record label or nothing like that. I was just looking at like friends and brothers and people. You know who gonna be around each other or be cool. You know you in the streets you meet people that you know um, are not there for the rest of your life. You you know that it's just a passing moment. But sometimes you'll meet people. Like I said, I always lean over on my on my brother Young Twan. You said it records. You know the first day me and Twan hung out, we've been hanging out ever since then. There wasn't no no we ain't never had no argument, no nothing. Me and Twan been hanging ever since then. So even though Twan. Is you set of records, you know, Twan is still infinite as well because our relationship is infinite, you know. So that's what that's what sparked the label right there. Me, Hank, and Steve, and Hank, and Hank Living One. Well, Infinite Recordings, uh, I remember it started back in 1995, and uh, the story of Infinite Recording was uh, I have a cousin, my cousin was Mr. Dewey Death, and uh, he was with these guys. And he's doing this thing, he makes some music on the music, on the music scene, doing this thing with these big drug dealers in the town. And um, a situation happened to where they kind of like separated went their own ways a little bit. They were seeing each other. So the guys, <clears throat> I guess they um, were looking for him. So I guess one of the guys called him up and was like, you know what, hey, man, uh, I need to work the spot for me. The dude was like, man, I don't work no spots or whatever it may be. So. But these guys, I guess they had an agenda, but these were friends of his. So so one of these guys, they kind of tricked him over to one of their spots one time, and they got into it. A bunch of like 20 guys tried to jump him. And uh, no, they didn't hurt him or nothing like that, but they tried to jump him. And uh, the main guy kind of put like a, a big tech on him. So the dude kind of looked up at him, and he kind of like, man, you know, it's like that. And so the guy kind of came into his senses and realized, like, it's my friend, I guess, or whatever it may be. And so they took one of the dreads off trying to do some humiliation. So anyways, I ain't know nothing about it. So I, uh, one of my cousins, my cousin Kurt, came up to me one day. He came telling me, he was like, um, you know what happened to the cuz? I'm like, no, I heard what happened to him. He said, well, you know, you got two, you got to jump you, man, come with his dress, whatever. 
So I start calling, reaching out to him. You know, I'm trying to catch him and find him. So when I when I finally catch up to him, you know, I called him over Kelvin, we got to talking. And um, he was telling me what happened. He was like, man, you know, how it all went down. And he said he was outside the guy's house for like for a whole night straight waiting for him to come home. So he's gonna kill him, you know, probably was gonna kill him, man. You know, it was that serious. But you know, God, you know, for a reason it didn't happen. And so he just went his way. So anyway, so I got with him, I was like, man, you know, you my cousin. Whatever man, what we're gonna do about it? And he kind of said to himself, he's like, listen here, you know, these guys, you know, they ain't no pushovers. They see, they, they gangster, they really about it. He said, you know, y'all, we really gangster about it. So it is too much killing. And so went on, it is too much killing. So he's like, man, it ain't even worth it. <clears throat> so, and how he talked to it, I had that talk. And um, I love music, you know what I'm saying? I love music. Like, I, I used to go to flip side all the time. It was a store in Milwaukee and had all the hot underground artists. You know, I used to go, and get the stuff that people ever seen. And I brought the E-40s and the adopted uh, DJ Quicks and, and, and Two Shorts in my town. He had all the undergrounds. They had all the best stuff in underground. So I used to love, I used to hear from music. I love music. But I never wanted to be a rapper or nothing. So I was sitting at home, man, after they had that talk. And I was thinking to myself, like, man, you know, I really want to help Cubs. I really want to help them get in a situation. So I called him up and I was like, listen, man, I know they pay them cash back and everybody, they, they're going against you. We're going to start our own record label. I'm gonna get behind you, you know. I came across a little money, and I was like, "Man, we're gonna go hard." He was like, "Bet he was with it." So uh, I remember that. And then you know, we kind of hooked up. He took me to meet Hank, man, and it's the first time I met Hank. And uh, Hank, man, I heard Hank music. And all I can think of Dr. Dre, man. This guy was tight, man. He was a business way back then, man. He ain't had that much equipment. He was making beats that nobody ever, that that, that nobody was doing. And I was like, "Man, we're gonna, we're gonna do it." So keep a long story short, basically. We got together and we tried to come up with a name. And I, I'll never forget this. We was at Hank House. And uh, do it all, do the devil was always creative for like the, from the names to the look. And like he was real precision with prestige with things real. That was his thing. So we was like, uh, we need a name. So we were gonna call it Black Mafia. Cause that's what we were rolling up under back then, Black Mafia music. And Black Mafia has been a uh, strong black business man, you know. And uh, we was like, we gonna call it Black Mafia, Black Mafia. And Hank was like, no, 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 we can't call it that, man. We can't do that. So that's, you know, that's too gangster. You know what I'm saying? We got to leave this thing that's going to mean something, stand behind it. And I remember doing it, do it came up, and he was like, man, we'll call it Infinite, Infinite, for some reason. And Infinite means forever. The only thing forever is God. So I did be special. So we called it Infinite Recording, you know, because we used the Infinite sign, and then we used the Black Mafia for the management company. <clears throat> so basically with that, that's how Infinite Recording came about, came about. And it got started. That's the end of the record. It was basically formed in my house, in my dining room. You know what I'm saying? And and uh, Do It To Death introduced me to Big Steve-O. You know what I'm saying? Who's now Uncle Steve-O now. <laughs> I mean, he was little Steve-O back then. Now he's big Uncle Steve-O. But anyway, it was formed uh, in my uh, dining room. And we could, we had to come up with a name, and Dante came up with the name Infinite, because it means that's universal. That's like forever. That's like on and on and on. That was a universal name. So, you know, from that, you know what I'm saying, it elevated to Infinite Four Five. Infinite Four Five. That's when uh, Raffin Smalls came in the picture, and it, it shifted gears, and then it took off from there. We did. We knock off a whole, knock off a whole lot of stuff real quick. Then we did Do It to Death. But then we did a uh, Cuckoo Cow. Cuckoo Cow was working with Cuckoo Cow. We was working with Dante. I was working. I was doing everything. I was working like a hog in the studio. So I'm doing this, doing that. But you know, that's how we did the, my projects. I know we still talked about Trump. I know how how that grind was. That was Trump. We first hit the road. Yeah, we we was just honestly just passionate about the music. Passionate about trying to get uh, the thoughts that I had in my head. Trying to get them out. Uh, trying to start something we was watching what other people were doing like uh, Master P and other artists and remember at this time nobody I mean we had a speech from Arrested Development from Milwaukee and he was saying he was from Atlanta at the time so we didn't really have anybody representing Milwaukee on a national level we had some people I don't, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus shout out to Ice Moan shout out to Reality Records uh, so those cats was, was definitely trying to do their thing, but wasn't nobody uh, doing it illustrious. illustrious. Ain't, nobody had the kind of swagger like 
like Jay Z or, or nobody was, you know, had that kind of personification to back it up and, you know, and the cars and, and the glit and the glamour and everything. So, you know, we start printing up our little tapes, you know, print up, print up a little tapes and just go stand in front of the mall and just, you know, I remember we, we did uh, the first, the first Do It to Death project, the first Do It to Death project, like, no, nobody wasn't really buying it. We were, we was pushing it on our in our own minds, but nobody wasn't really buying it because they didn't know us or whatever. So, you know, we was like just pitching them. You know, five dollars, five dollars, little CD, three dollars a CD. You know, little eight song EP or whatever. And um, and then we did a little single uh, called Right Back at You, which which actually was like one of our best selling. Um, best selling products because you know right back at you was like such a sweet deal because we had two songs two songs on a little tape and we were selling them for three dollars and I remember when the when the when the order when the CD order or the tape order for right back at you first came in the mail we was at Steve house and they came in the mail and we was gonna wait we was gonna take it on the road go down south and pitch them out the trunk and me and Steve stopped at Capitol Court and um, we was we was playing the song, and I remember this kid was like, "Man, who is that?" And we started telling him, and he bought a tape. And before you know it, me and Steve had sold the whole, you know, it's about about three thousand CDs, me and three thousand tapes. Me and Steve sold them, you know, right there in front of the store, right there in front of in front of Capitol Court. You know, we had literally hand to hand these these tapes, and we just started, you know, getting. And Steve had a little, you know, a Camry there. And we were getting the camera and just basically like just tour the world, man. Just we young, you know, in our early 20s, just young, no care in the world, just selling tapes, selling CDs, um, trying to make a name for ourselves, but more importantly, just trying to get our movement going. And that's basically how to how to grind. I used to break them cats, man. You know, rap and smile, you know what I'm saying? You know, the thousand, two thousand dollar bets, man. You know, and I knew them guys was gonna always be something, man, because I could see Rav coming through the town, man, in the big old bins, man, the green bins, and you know, Coop back then, you know, only people who drive that was basketball players than me, you know. <laughs> so I see them cats, you know what I'm saying? They had flavor like I did, and I knew they was gonna be bigger than what, you know, the average person was gonna be in Milwaukee. But then when I seen Steve O and you know, all the other brothers coming to the play, man. You start seeing the bigger picture. You know, you start seeing corporate uh, moves being made. And uh, that's one thing I always respected about those guys. They knew how to go from the ghetto streets to the executive suites. You know, I made a movie called it From the Ghetto Streets to the Executive Suites. Just, that's just how profound and how serious I am about taking nothing and making it into something. And that's what they did at Infinite Records. They actually took a bunch of ghetto niggas that was just out there, you know, clowning, rapping in basements, you know, and took them to a whole nother level. They went into the big old studios, they started flying across the world, you know, they was doing shows overseas, you know, Cuckoo Cow, my project was bigger than the world, you know, and I was proud to say that I was from Milwaukee. Uh, I was all got started, man, we used to go on the, on the road, and we used to go hit all over the world like that. It was like 1994 before we got started five, and I was the freak in Atlanta, man. And I never forget, I'm down there, all these young black people down there, and uh, they're from all over. And, and a lot of black, beautiful black people, they were telling me they had all these different events, like the, uh, the, uh, the Derby, the Louisville, Louisville, and all these different events. So I went back home, I said, man, we're gonna hit the road, man. We got our music, we go to all these different cities. So we went to selling tapes, man, it was me, do it, uh, my team, like my brothers, Ra Ra, Gucci, Duck, Big Up Big, Jay Swiss, man, we got on the road, man, I bought a Camry, and we went in a rental car, we went to State State to sell the music out the trunk. This is the same, was the same time when E-40 them was grinding like this. We was just like them, grinding out the trunk, trying to make it happen, man. And, uh, you know, that's how we that's how we get our music out there. So, you know, we was going through things and, uh, you know, making a name for ourselves, selling music out the trunk, and uh, things looking good. We had, we, had, we had the city on lock, man, we was, uh, we were making a buzz, man, you know what I'm saying? It was crazy. We had like a big buzz going, you know? So, you know, any time with fame come destruction. And I'll never forget, man, that uh, it, came to, it came time, a part of the situation to where uh, 
one of, one of, one of the dudes' baby mamas turned around and lied to him. I was, uh, I was trying to mess with her or something like that. I never forget this. And uh, do it. I don't, know, I don't know, they had a big argument with her or something like that, and she just said to make you mad. He never know how that kind of person. My cousin, like, with that shit. And uh, he just left, man. I know mean, he just left us, man. He just left the music of everything, and he was what he meant for me. I remember, man, being, being on a real grind, interstate to interstate, you know, like doing all these different things with the label, like as far as promoting shows, I mean, man, we was opening up, we had Dude to Death opening up for uh, Immature, you know, and Chicago and Atlanta, all the freak neeks performing and doing all these shows. And, man, I, just, I, just, I had a good time, man. I mean, it's, as far as what I'm saying is like, man, we've been doing this shit for damn near 15 years or more. You know what I'm saying? But uh, it's been a great time, man. I mean, in the malls, you know what I'm saying? Getting our promotion on. You know, always having the uh, tapes out, CDs out, promoting our parties and all our shows. You can get thrown out a lot of malls, you know what I'm saying? But hey, good looking to, you know, Mall of Memphis. You know, y'all still good, yo. Know, y'all let us get our thing in. We did our good time there. Minnesota, can't forget y'all either. Mall of America, you know, yeah, we've been there too. You know, but uh, man, people show much love though. Every state we go to, they they always bought our CDs though. You know what I'm saying? I remember, like I said, it's been a while, man. I, I I've been through so much marijuana. You know, my my, my, my mind got kind of cloudy. So I can't pimp, I, I won't be able to pinpoint the exact, you know, exact to the but. I think I was I was working on some stuff myself. If I ain't mistaken, I think I was working on a campaign, a song I had called Campaign. It was a song I was working on, and uh, me and Steve was trying to put something together on the end of, uh, uh, of just working with me, of putting, of putting my music out. And uh, and uh, I, I, I always told Cal, even from the beginning, that he should rap because of his expression and because of his, 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 his delivery. And so I used to take him to the studio with me. We used to go uh, get down with Steve over Hank and would take. I used to always take him to the studio with me, man, and, uh, you know, Cal always had that, like I say, he had that expression and he had that delivery. So when I brought him in the studio, he was a natural for it, man. He, he was a natural for it. It's kind of like they always say, when somebody walk in the room, you can tell they got that, that presence about them. That's how it was with Cal when he, when he, when he rapped in, when he first started coming to the studio with me, then, you know, my people, man, they hear his voice, they hear his expression, his, his delivery, a lot of people can relate to it, man, so. That's, that's what I remember most about it. Man, well, what it was, man, I got a pimp partner by the name of Seven. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I was rapping. Actually, he the man got me to start rapping, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, I just wanted to, you know what I'm saying? Them niggas was hustling good, man. I was a straight, stone cold alcoholic, man. And I just, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm just trying to go to the store and get something to drink. And my man just kept trying to push me towards his music, man. And uh, one day, man, he took me up uh, for those that know in Milwaukee uh, on Flores, man. I think Hank, Hank and his moms were staying in the apartment, man. And uh, go back there in that apartment, man, back there in his room, man. If man barely had room for a bed, man, he had that old equipment up in there, man. They was <laughs> up in there doing that motherfucking thing, man. That's the first time I met uh, uh, Hank, man. Mm -hmm. So uh, how you think Cuckoo Cow? Damn. Ain't that a bitch? Well, actually, no. <laughs> the name Cuckoo actually came from man. You know, when I was younger, man, I used to, I used to DJ and shit, man. And um, you know, I used to have a lot of my guy. I had one of them cribs where you know, like some motherfuckers, moms and pops, they weren't allowing a bunch of niggas in the house, right? My mom and daddy ain't get no fuck. You know what I'm saying? All the niggas used to come hang out by my crib, smoke their little weeds, drink their little drinks and shit, <laughs> and uh. <laughs> And, uh, you know, my, my mama, since I was 12 years old, man, she was, you know, diagnosed, she, she was mentally ill, you know what I'm saying? So motherfuckers was coming around the crib, and they was, you know, you know, they look around like, damn, this man, motherfucking family dog, they crazy as a motherfucker, you know? They start calling me Cuckoo, man, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, the name just kind of stuck with me, Cuckoo. Actually, they wasn't calling, they were saying Cuckoo, but that ain't how, you know, the name Cuckoo Cow came about because I was DJ and they called me, just called me Cool Cow B then. Then, you know, when it came time for a motherfucker to start fucking with this rap, like, what's his name? You know, motherfucker straight out the door was like, Cuckoo, nigga, <laughs> you crazy ass, nigga, you crazy ass family. And that's, that's, that's where it came about real tough.
Uh, when you first started rapping, let them know a little bit about your first album, Gang. How you started to get the name for yourself in the rap side of the thing? Gang, yeah, first happened, uh, man, I was fucking with this cat, um, 88 Keys out of Milwaukee. Y'all might know him. Uh, they did a little deal with Scarface of G2 Key, man. He had produced the first album. I was fucking with another cat named uh, G Money. You know, seven me, the cat Stoney, Ian McPhee. We all was a group called Stone Cold, right? And, uh, the coldest motherfucker to me back then, you know what I'm saying, was this cat G Money. He was so talented, man. He still is talented, man. Shout out to G Money. Anyway, uh, a motherfucker, you know what I'm saying, uh, 88 Keys, you know, he felt, which I felt too, like, dude should be the first one to, to, to do an album, you know, like a solo album. And, uh, you know, G was real talented with writing and wording and all that. You know, my nigga Seven, it, by that time, it got me in the mode of, you know, I was trying to fuck with this music a little bit. I wrote my first little rap and all that. And his older brother, you know what I'm saying, balling in the game, you know, he was like, shit, if I stick some money into it, I'm, I'm putting my money behind this street nigga. This nigga talking this, this ghetto shit, I'm finna put my money behind dude. Even though I felt like G Money and I think everybody else really did too, was should have been the first runner up. But, uh, yeah, we put out the album called Game, man. And, uh, you know, I got, uh, uh, we, we ordered a thousand CDs, man, and we put the order in, and uh, before it got back to us, uh, the feds came down on all my folks, you know what I'm saying? And uh, they was in the fed joint, man. I was in the street bad, man, with them, them gang CDs, man. I'm talking about, uh, that's where the, really the, the name, you know what I'm saying? A, a motherfucker got his recognition in Milwaukee, man. I was just out there grinding the shit out of them CDs, man. You just think a motherfucker... Pull in a motherfucker, walk out the house, man, go get three, four hundred like it ain't nothing, man. Sh this shit was lovely to me, you know? And uh, that's why I started making a name for myself, man, with, the, with that game album. Seven. In the studio. Seven. Well, well, you brought Seven and Cooper to the studio. And, and I was like, okay, what are we doing? Who is dude? <laughs> she was like, man, I think dude sound real good over your beats, man. Yeah, I'm like, okay, well, yeah, 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 okay, let's see. You know, but you know, Steve had a vision, and it went on from there. I remember, uh, shout out to Quad motherfucking graphics, you understand me? <laughs> I was working at Quad graphics, man, I'll never forget, man. Uh, yeah, we, we did, like he, like he was saying, the whitey called me crazy, cut, uh, do a death had wrote the hook, that was the first song we had did, man. And after we did Why They Call Me Crazy, we did uh, uh, Ain't Got No Mercy, man. That was the first two songs we did, man. And then uh, we came along, we started recording, man. We seen that we, uh, you know what I'm saying, we was a package, we was a package, man. We fitted like a hand in a glove, man. And uh, everything we started making, that shit just started getting colder and colder and colder. And, uh, you know what I'm saying, uh, Steve-O was down, you know what I'm saying, from day one with, with Big Hank, you know what I'm saying, Seven and introduced me to that whole little infinite camp. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, he ended up on the run when the feds came down. He was on the run, everybody else that went to the joint. And, uh, man, we put together that album, man, and um, uh, Ralph and Smalls, I think, do it to death, you know what I'm saying, as far as, to my knowledge, it brought Ralph and Smalls in the picture. And, uh, you know what I'm saying, I remember, uh, you know what I'm saying, they coming through with some paper to a player, you know what I'm saying, a hurting, starving motherfucker, like, here you go, cuckoo. Man, I said, man, fuck this job, man, you know what I'm saying, we had Walking Dead, man, a motherfucking classic album, man. They stepped in the picture, man, we got all the stars on the album, we had Spice One, Mac 10, uh, we was fucking with the Outlaws, who else, Hank, man, speak, man, cut me off at any motherfucking time. Uh, what shit? They uh, said it all. Uh, Twister. Twister, Twister was on the album, you know what I'm saying. And uh, man, we, we got out here, man, and we grind that motherfucker hard. And uh, he came through, he had this dude with him. And uh, it was Cuckoo Cat. So we know who he is. We was like, who's this cat? He's like, that's my man Cuckoo, man, I want you to manage him, you know what I'm saying? So we uh, put something together. And Hank had to take a look at Hank's studio. He played his music, he played his beats. And Cuckoo went over there and he snapped out, man. He had a rap called uh, Most Wanted. Like, he, he said something to rap, and he was like, man, you know, a friend of me is, a, is, is an enemy. And like, man, it was cold, man. I was like, this nigga's tight, man. So basically, making a long story short, we just got to fuck with him. And uh, so when Tay left us, we just kind of left out there. I'm going to fuck a cuckoo. So me and Hank, we just started grinding, man. We did our first two songs. One called Why They Call Me Crazy, and uh, We Have No Mercy. No Mercy, two cold songs. And, uh, and we were just doing our thing. 
was working hard with the music. And at this time, Cal, you know, he had a drug problem, but it was, it was bad as I knew it was. So the whole process of trying to make that happen and, and, and make that situation work, we had to go chase him, man. I had to go get him out of drug houses. I had to keep him in the studio. You know, I first signed him. I, I, I fixed his whole crib up for him. His house got, got flooded. I went to get new furniture and everything, and there was money in his pocket. You know, so I always treat him as a man. So me and Hank working with him, we put this album together called Walking Dead. And um, the album was tight. So taking him around a little bit, and we was talking, talking. I let Taylor the album, Taylor see what we was doing. And uh, he had a friend that was off 4-5. This, this guy, which was a good friend of mine to this day, like my brother, is um, Smalls. You know, Smalls and Rap and QC. And, um, you know, they heard the CD. When they heard a lot of time kicking it, they heard the CD. And when they heard the CD, they wanted to be a part of the movement. So, you know, we all, we all went to New York to the All-Star Game, party with Mike Tyson and everybody. Both had this big party out there, it was a big party. And uh, so we sat down at the table with an uh, understanding that we're going to do some music together. So, that was the Infinite Chords, you know, we did Infinite, that's what Infinite Four Five created. And it was like, you know, they was Four Five, I was Infinite. Uh, and that's how that, that, that came apart. That was, you know, that's how that came apart. You know, I was working on the, the, the joint venture, man. Me and Steve was trying to put a joint venture together with uh, myself at the end of Trump record label and, uh, and the Infinite. And um, at that time, I was putting out um, Cal's album, um, the very first one he ever did. At the time, I was, you know, I was a young, 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 real young dude then, man. And I always had that hunger for it. So way back then, I was putting out um, his first game, working with 88 Keys on that. 88 Keys did the production on that. And I was putting that out, and uh, at the time I was under investigation by the feds at that time. So before I could even get the CDs back, you know, I sent the CDs out to get the 5,000, 10,000 uh, 10, copies pressed up and shit like that. And before the CDs could even come back, man, I was, I was waiting on the CDs to come back. And before I could even get the CDs back in the mail, the mass copies, man, I was I was on the run from the feds. They got the kicking doors and shit like that. So. I was on the run at that time, so I hid out in Atlanta for a while then, hid out in New York, hid out in Minnesota, and uh, and I used to always come back to Milwaukee here and there, chop a few loose ends, or I come back and I, I visit my family while I was on the run from the feds. I was I would sneak back into Milwaukee here and there, man, and I got a chance to get my hands on some CDs, so even then I was out pushing the music, but that's when I um uh, I took Cal to Steve Ball. And I told you know, I told Cal that uh, you know, Steve was a good dude, man. You know, uh, I don't. I, I, at the time, I already knew I was facing like ten to life because my co-defendants were all, already locked up. I was the last one on my case to get locked up. All my co-defendants was already locked up, and I was communicating with my brother at that time through somebody that was going to go see him, and he had already told him like, "Tell dude, you better, you better keep running. He's facing ten, ten to life." And I already knew I was gonna, you know, run for as long as I could. So, but I always wanted to make sure that. Uh, that Cal was straight, and like I said, by me being around Infinite, I know how they had that hunger for that music. It was only right for me to, um, to you know, to introduce Cal to Steve Ball, you know, really, you know, like man, this this my man right here, you know, Steve Ball, good dude, man. If something happened to me, if I don't be able to be out here, man, if I ain't if I ain't back fast enough, go ahead and work for the man, do what y'all do, and uh, I'll see you when I get back. And that really right there was the beginning. That really was the beginning right there. And shit, sure enough, like about three or four months later, I was gone. I was gone. We started doing it big, man. We were the first people in town to put a big old billboard on Fond du Lac and Capitol. Everybody was going crazy. We had like three album covers up there. Eyes, Nola, Do It to Death, Cuckoo Cow. You know, we, uh, we, we was doing the album. We had Twister on the album, Mac 10, Spice One, and Outlaws. I mean, we were doing our thing, man. And uh, my man, Young Twine, you know, he's a good guy. He, he hustled hard as us. He was a one man team, he hustled hard as we was. He was the other hot person in the town at that time. And uh, you know, Twine, at this time, we called Twine, he was working with Swab House and Tony Draper, eight ball of them. And uh, he was out there, and so he took the music out to Tony Draper. So Tony Draper, Tony Draper liked what he heard, so he said, I want to have a meeting with them. So my guy QC, and he went out there and met Draper, and they was talking and stuff. He was like, man, come on down, they really want to do something. So basically, we got with Tony Draper, and we was like, hey, man, we ain't signed to nobody, we can do a 50 50 deal. So we had to bring $150,000 to the table to do a distribution deal to Tony Draper and Universal. So, you know, we're thinking this on. We're going to give him $150,000. We think it's going to go down, you know, with Universal. And then, you know, something happened between Draper and Universal to where they kind of blackballed him. 
some of that situation where they blackballed him. And, and Universal just called us and they asked for the album cover. We sent the album cover in. So we about we to drop the album. Everything got put on hold because I had between them. He ended up getting dropped. And it was like, damn. So we went to call like, where our money at? The man tried to run off with our money. He didn't want to give us our money, man. So I'm like, what? And so me, small, rap, rap, we was like, fuck that shit. So we went down to Houston, man, tore the man's office up, looking for him. You know, couldn't catch him. And uh, my man Small was like, we're going to get it the right way. So we put them lawyers on, litigators, went to the loans, got the money back, you know, after all that. You know, but that was some fucked up shit. That one fucked up part of the game. So, you know, after that situation, we're like, fuck it. We back on the independent grind. So we went back to like uh, Selecto Hits and uh, South by Southwest, my man Robert out there. And we went to sell an independent record. We had to walk it dead off the chain, popping, going hard, man. So we doing our thing and everything. And, but the more money we was making, the more money we was putting out. So we were, wasn't nobody really seeing no money. We was making money, wasn't nobody really seeing no money. So it was kind of like attitudes start coming up. People wanted more. People thought they deserved this, deserved that, deserved that. And it was like, it was rough times, man. I can remember I'm going to jail in the process. And, uh, and you know, everything was just falling apart. Like, you know, and we got to the part where did nobody want to spend no more money. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's just like, fuck it. You know what I'm saying? And I, I, I say this because the story about how my projects came up. Because we were pushing so hard, and then we did In My Projects, and at that time, you know, through all of the hand-to-hand -hand CD selling and everything, we were making connections and all of that, and we were able, you know, to uh, broker a little deal with Tommy Boy uh, at that time. At the time, I'm, I'm being, like, real talk, you know, I'm just going to keep it real. I'm, I told Steve oh, I do the DVD, but I'm, I'm real talk. Like, at the time, you know, I really was like, you know, like during the time we did the whole In My Projects thing, I really was like way in the back with that because, you know, I was a little, not disgruntled with the label, but because I, I really felt like I helped start the label and I, um, I, I helped start the label. And, and when we was doing the Cuckoo Cow project, um, Cal wasn't, Cal wasn't my definition of what Infinite was supposed to be because because like people was looking at, people was taking my life and the things that I'm saying, like if you listen, go back and listen to them songs, the stuff I was saying was so honest and so real, it's like I'm pouring my life. And then it's like, I'm watching people who saying they're gangsters and I'm like, you're not a gangster. And this is no just to cow, but I'm keeping real, keep it all the way funky. Like, you know, like you're not a gangster, you smoke crack. You, you know what I'm saying, you're not hustling. You're not doing none of that. And then you, you know what I'm saying, it's like, and people was pushing that like it was it was the real deal and I'm sitting there like that's not what Infinite was built on, we built on realness. You know what I'm saying? So I kinda like at that time just backed away from the label altogether and was doing my own thing. I started working on uh, the life to tell of a rapper and um Hustler's theme music. Um, and what was the other if they could see me now? I start working on me and Hank just kinda like buried ourselves. Those CDs, I wish Hank would release those CDs. You know, put them on YouTube or something. Even today, that's the dopest music nobody ever heard. It's the dopest music, I promise you. Uh, the life to tell of a rapper, Hustlers theme music, and uh, if they can see me now, the the dopest three CDs ever. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. Like, I got songs. Y'all come holler. I got songs. I sell them. I, I sell those songs right now because they that that serious. My project was actually an accident. It was an accident all together, but it was. It was it was something that God put it put to make happen. The beat that I actually did for my projects, that was a number one hit song, matter of fact. Make sure y'all sure look that up. You know. But anyway, the beat was a remix to that Mac 10 song, the Cuckoo song. And then uh uh the beat, I was just doing something, just fooling around in the studio, just trying something, because that's what I, I do. I lay uh, instrumentals and try to line vocals up. But anyway, Cuckoo heard the beat. He's like, man, you like, yeah. He's like, man, dog, that beat, that beat under that song. He's like, dog, Hank, I think I got something to that. <laughs> so, uh, I was like, for real? Okay. He's like, man, give me the instrumental. Man. And that's how I started from there. Work on that song. And, and, and now, you remember one of the reasons why we did the remix in the first place when Tay was getting mad and he, he, we didn't want to do it? How the accident happened was like, it was a remix and tape, like I got tired of it. I remember. 
Tay, I remember Tay wanted to, nah, y'all wanted it to be the remix, and Tay was going to do something on the song, but he knew that I wanted to fuck with it, I had something to it, and even though Tay really wanted to do something, he was being generous, and he was like, man, no, nah, let Cal do his thing, or let dude do his thing, y'all was like, no, nah, man, this going to be the remix, that shit going to sound cold with the Mac 10 song, man. I remember, and, and I remember it, you saying that too. Was Tay, was, Tay was sticking up for me, like, no, nah, man, let, let, let Cal go on and do his thing over there, let him go on and do his thing. And then he let me, man, I remember I had that motherfucker, uh, I really had the chorus for a while after I got the beat, and we, I hadn't did nothing to it until they brought your boy Tabari in the play. And I remember me in the backyard pacing in the sun, Hank, I go, I write a verse, and then I walk in his backyard, just walk around the backyard, I come up with another verse. That was still when a motherfucker was young and good with that shit. I wasn't using no motherfucker pen. I was doing it off the top of the motherfucker head, like that whole walking dead album, that classic motherfucker album. I ain't touch no pen. And I ain't saying I'm just that clever or a talented. I'm just a lazy motherfucker, and I ain't want to write. I ain't feel like taking the time to write. So a motherfucker, you know, Hank be like, okay, go back in the yard, niggas. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I go in the yard, man, and bust another verse, you know what I'm saying? It came about. That's when the cat Tabari from Jive came down to fuck with us, man. You know what I'm saying? <coughs> Money hoes, cars, and clothes. No, I'm just bullshit. <laughs> uh, man, uh, the best, you know what I'm saying? If, if I, you mean then? Yeah, yeah. If I had to think of some of the best shit, it's really, man, overall, man, fuck the money, man. Nigga was getting good money with them shows, man. I was doing, like, I did, like, shit for, like, six, eight months straight, man. Three to four shows a week strong, you know what I'm saying? But uh, if I fuck the money, man, if I had to say, man, like just personally me, some of the, the best shit that happened is traveling and, and meeting the, the different pieces. Meeting the, the different people and going to different places, man. Places I hadn't seen and shit. It's, 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 it's priceless, man. Memories, man, that I got for the rest of my life. And now, you know what I'm saying, nigga older, got kids. I want them to see some of the shit I seen because that was some of the, you know, some of the, my good times, man. My best, thing, my best thing coming out of that, hold on. My best thing coming out of that was like, uh, just getting on, basically, just making an impact in in the history books, like, you know, actually doing it, because there's a million people still trying to do it, and then there's a million people that been trying to do it back then, still trying to do it right now, that still ain't did it, and I did it, and that was the best enjoyment out of that, so, you know. So, yeah, I man, I, I remember my projects, making that song magical, like it was God meant, because how it happened, was uh, we had a song with Mac 10 called Set Up Shop on the Walking Dead album. It was Mac 10, Cuckoo, and Little Nee. So we were gonna do a remix to it. And uh, do, we were put Dude to Death on there. So Dude to Death was like, I don't, I don't, I don't want this song, I don't feel it no more. So we was like, fuck it, you know. And, but Cal kept saying, Cuckoo was like, I hear something to this beat, I hear something to it. I got something for it. But we don't really pay attention. So basically, I was like one day, I was like, man, fuck that, hey, let's, let's let him do it, man, let's let him do it. I, 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 let's let him just fuck with us, see. So he came over, man, to the Hank basement. I never forget this. He started rapping the song. He started doing it in my project. You know, he's going, he had a little radio. He walking back and forth outside, come to the basement, write a verse, go back, come back, write a verse, go back, and write a verse. So he finished the song. We just had it there for a minute. And um, so this time, everybody stopped fucking around. Everybody, was tired again. My niggas were four five. They was like they ain't spending no more money. Uh, the cuckoo was, you know, had his problems, his drug problem going on. You know, and you know, Hank, my man Hank, you know, he wanted some money from stuff. He was doing. Everybody's like, kind of like finished, like really, like not really, like fuck it. So I was like, fuck this shit. I hear something. So my man Smalls, he ended up meeting this chick named Terica, and Terica, uh, she knew a dude named uh, I, I, uh, Tobias. I, he worked for Jive. So he would come to town hear some of our music. So, so Twani and uh, Small brought Terrica to Milwaukee and they brought Tobias when he come in. So he came in there and replaced So he heard my project. He went crazy. Like, I got to have this. I got to have this. So he went crazy. He wanted the song. So now everybody get, get their vibe back. So when, I, when we came to it, now I'm fucked up. Now my pocket's fucked up, you know. Everybody fucked up. Hank was like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm not even giving no song out. So it's no small. So everybody mad and everything. People want to do something. People like, everyone, everyone, there's some real killer stuff going on. Like, now I love Hank like a brother, man. I'm not letting that happen to us. I love him like a brother. So I told Hank, man, I just got this rag I had. It was like a 
thirty thousand dollar ring I had. I just gave it to him. Like, hey man, take my ring. Give me the song. I'll make sure you owe me some money if this go down. I'm not fuck that ring. I'm not tripping. I feel this. It's like God giving the talent. So we ended up giving the song to uh, so he gave him the song, he ended up giving it to the bias. Uh he would have to jive. Now the crazy thing about this is he had the song then from the side of Petey Pablo at the time. So it was between Petey Pablo and Cuckoo. So he's sitting there with it and they went with Petey Pablo and they take the Cuckoo song. But he had a guy named Jamar. Jamar with Jamal. But Jamar was a good dude. So Jamar heard a song like, I got to have that record. Give me that record. So Jamar gets it. He runs over to the Tommy Boy where Cypher Sounds, Cypher Sounds was at. And they played for them. They love. They called out the game. You know what I'm saying? They give us a little bit of money like that. And about the time, that time, my record company was destroyed. So everybody really done doing something. So I had to take the small end of the money. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't really about the money, about the process of, 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 of getting bigger. So we take the deal or whatever. And it's a single deal with an option for an album. So we take the deal. You know, I couldn't leave, I couldn't leave the state because I'm on probation. And so Smalls fly out there with, with Cuckoo and everybody. And you know, the deal, everybody come back. Now it's coming out to the money shit. It's not everybody on some money tripping shit. So I was personally like, I got a bigger vision. So I'm like, fuck that money shit. I was saying, after I first got sentenced, I got, I got 11 years at the time. And I knew that in the feds, after 11 years, I had to do at least, well, I got 14 years. And I knew off of 14 years at the time I was going to do at least 11, 12 years. So once I got sentenced, man, I didn't want to have nothing to do with no music, nothing like that. I just, I'm just i trying to figure out how the fuck I'm going to do all this time. You know, so after a while, man, after I kind of got, for lack of a better word, as I got settled in, I started back moving with the music again. I was picking up the publications and the sources and all that type of shit, man. And, and I really stopped communicating with the street, too, besides my mom. And my son's mom at the time, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to talk to nobody. I just wanted to try to figure out how the hell I'm going to get through this time. So I had really known that, you know, the music was going to come up like that for Infinite and for Cuckoo to like maybe after like a, a year after it was already bubbling up under the surface. So by the time I picked the magazine up, I started seeing in the magazines and this and that. And, and then one day I was in the TV room watching BET, uh, uh, The Basement, man. And I seen the video pop up. I'm sitting in the TV room. I'm like, man, you know, and it, it, it shocked me so bad. I just got up and I just left out the TV room. And I just I went back. I remember going back, sitting in my cell, sitting, sitting on the bed, like, damn. Because at that time, that's something real, real big, man. So I'm going back. I remember going back, sitting in my cell on the bed, I'm like, damn, my nigga made it, you know. And I didn't even want to tell nobody in the prison, like, you know. That's my guy, man, you know, we did that, you know, by the block, you know, us dudes be like, eh, you're right, you're right, so I kept it to myself for a while, man, I kept it to myself for a while, and I just kind of, um, you know, I did, it, on the inside, I was always, you know, I would always pray for him, man, and, and, and hope he'd be successful, and then at, at, at that time, that what kind of gave me the fuel to get through my bit, because I'm like, damn, if my nigga on, I know if I get out, I know I'm on because at that at that time I had the mentality. I was walking around the prison with the mentality like, man, I ain't going home, man. Shit, I ain't, you know, I got too much time, you know. So I wasn't even thinking about going home. I was just thinking about how I'm gonna survive, and if I do make it home, shit, I, you know, I'm making home. So that kind of gave me like a lot of fuel after seeing that, man. I was like, oh, if my nigga on like this, shit, it got to be beautiful when I come home, you know. So. That's when I kind of got back into the music, man. Like I said, at, at that time, the particular prisons that I was in, they didn't have electronic instruments and shit like that. So I started picking up the bass, the drum, piano, whatever I could get my hands on. And I got back into the music and I started reading the magazines again. And I, a lot of the success that I watched the project, I, I watched it through the magazine or I just heard about it through the telephone. I wasn't actually there to, uh, to get to enjoy it, you know. But like I said, it felt good to see my nigga shine. So in, in a sense, I was there. but. Like I said, a lot of it, I, 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 you know, through telephone conversations, man, uh, through visits and stuff like that. I, I had to hear about the tours, and I got, you know, the pictures and everything. And after a while, I did kind of open it up and then start, you know, telling a few people that I knew around the prison, like, yeah, this is my guy. He wore a picture of me and my guy, shit like that. So it felt good to see him make it, man. And, and I always kept him in my prayers, so. You know, and he was in good hands with Steve O. So. Infamous E40, and uh, we ride down the streets. We in uh, E40 Fiends. And I heard, in my project, and I got to jumping up. I'm like, hey, man, that's from Milwaukee, man. That's my Milwaukee homies, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, and Cuckoo, I mean, uh, 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 E40 now, I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. 
you know, and uh, Cuckoo Cow was bumping, man, way in California, man. And that, to me, meant a lot, man. You know, what is the odds of you driving down the streets and minding your own business, and you got the window down, and you hear the number one single in the country, and it's your homeboy, somebody that you grew up with, somebody you've seen walking through the streets. Man, that was phenomenal. That was real big. And from there on, man, I, I just wanted to be a part of those cats, man. And, you know, fortunately for myself, I was able to, you know, acquaint myself with Steve-O. And Steve-O is a very brilliant young man. And we've been friends ever since. I mean, there's very few people I can say I'm still friends with because I usually annihilate my friends, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'll be afraid you didn't cut your head off. You know how I do. Y'all suckers know how I do. But he's one guy that he still got his head on, you know, and it's only because I allow him to have a head on, you know. <laughs> and, you know, two heads is always better than one. You know, I always been the cabbage head. He always been the, the brain head. So, you know, Steve was a great dude, man. He's a dear friend of mine. We was the first one to bring the celebrities to Milwaukee. So I knew I had to hook up with him. But I told him, I said, man, I got David Banner. I got Loom. I got uh, Trillville. All these guys coming. There was only one person who was able to understand him the magnitude of what I was trying to do, and that was steep -o. So I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of the aftermath of the Infinite Records. But Infinite Records, by far, is the biggest record label ever to come through Milwaukee. I don't think there never will be another Infinite Records because what those guys did and what they was thinking at the time, they was thinking like Damon Dash and Jay-Z and Kareem Biggs. They was thinking like P. Diddy, you know what I'm saying? They was on some, some real, real mega mobile shit. Whole time boy situation, it shit was so crazy. It was like it was at one point, man. You had Cal, you know, he was kind of known for being with all like the gangsters and stuff like that. You had me, I was cool with gangsters, the vice or because I was cool with a lot of people too. So we both had power, man, and and the thing got so bad, tough to get us like everybody wanted to kill each other. Like it was like you had two soldiers, head head of soldiers, and what, either one of us would have snapped our fingers. There'd been a lot of killing. So everything got so bad to where I had got a letter from Suge Knight. And I had sent up to Tommy Boy, and I said, I'm going to sell Cuckoo to Suge Knight. Tommy Boy got the call, and called Cuckoo, called me, what you want to do all that? Everyone thought we don't do it. I didn't do it, I probably should have, but I didn't do it. But it, it, it was it was so crazy, man, that that whole situation, that how I see how the industry breaks you up. I see how not just money breaks, but with people with their own agendas. I mean, I mean, we walked to Tommy one time, they tried to offer us $90,000. Like, we buy this Cuckoo Cap project for 90000 we told him, kiss our ass, that shit out of here. We're we'll doing 95, you know. And we should have took it, we know he's going to do it again <laughs> right now. But, and, you know, but that whole situation, man, was crazy because the process is that, that we got the deal, everybody stopped falling apart, and the feds came in. And they locked into my closest friends, my man Ralph and Smalls, and my brother QC, all three of us, all three of them, and gave them, uh, Life without parole, man, for nothing, you know. It's because they did some made name made a name in this game and was showing a lot of other people that what, what they could inspire to come if they worked hard. And um they they, they had to go on a conspiracy case with no evidence, no drugs, you know, no wiretaps, uh, their first offense and it gave them life, man. You know, gave them life because of that situation because they thought they, they could do something big and show the world something different. Come from Milwaukee, because Milwaukee was a racist town like that. And it was just crazy, man. And I, so now you got my, my, my best friend, they're going to prison for life, fight for their life. You know, we got Cuckoo and Tiny Boy trying to run them off from us. And uh, they do, they're doing their thing. So it was like me and Hank, and Hank, I got Hank, so much love for Hank, man, that he always been there no matter what. You know, even when, in fact, when, 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 uh, when, they, when everybody got on, when Cal got on, and Duke of Death, you know, he kind of felt that he should have been on. Because, you know, he was a hot rapper, you know, at the time. And so he wouldn't get his due, so he was trying to do his own thing, and he stopped falling away from the label. Uh, I can truly say regret that, you know, we first got the deal, when we were doing the business side, of me and him and Hank started in the label together. And I can really say that I wish we had better business sense, you know, because I think he should have got a piece of the label. Uh, even though he got paid, and he got money, you know, he got money from it, and you know he made money, money from it, and whatever he wanted, we did for him, you know that. And, but I think he was one of the piece, he was 2%. And, you know, Hank got a lot of money, and Dewey probably didn't see it that way. That they kind of made us all distance each other, too. We was all young. I always wasn't like, I wasn't getting no money. We were not making no money out of the We had our own money. But I was trying to make sure everybody fed. But people don't understand, you can't feed a million people off a little piece of pie, you know? And, but nobody, if you really understand that at the time, we were, you know, we was young, so we didn't know business sense or 
If I could take your thing and change thing around, I wish I could make that situation better because due to the death that Hank and Steve-O really were infinite. We started that together, you know. We had a lot of artists on the label like Freedom, Mr. Lee, you know, Keela, you know, uh, I know the rest in peace, you know, dope, you know, and I had all my family was walking for behind us pushing this project. But Infinite Records started with Steve-O, Big Hank, and Mr. George Dell. You know, he was the ideal man, Hank's music, and I was the marketing genius behind it, and, and, and financing it at the time. You know, before four five, black my black mouth always been there. Before Cuckoo Cow. So like this, like uh in the Tommy Boy situation began to spark a lot of little little jealousy that that because one, like whenever whenever I put out a product product on Infinite, you know, I'm serving as executive producer because I helped start this label. You know, um, Cuckoo was an artist on Infinite. I, I helped build Infinite, the Infinite side of the Infinite 45. I helped build Infinite. And Cuckoo was an artist on Infinite. And um, there was a lot of little jealousy going on, little girl stuff that was not gangsta at all. You know, it was just a lot of little girl stuff. Like, uh, I remember one time we had a show to do with Alicia Keys and Prince in uh, LA. We did a show in LA uh, with Alicia Keys, Prince. Uh, who else was on that on that bill? Blue Jermaine Trail, Dupree, Blue, Blue Contrail, and um, and so so they flew me in. They flew me in. Um, it was like, man, we want you to help uh, Cuckoo, because you know I've been performing all my life. So they like, we want you to help Cuckoo. Uh, you know, because I won't let them call me a hype man. I won't let them play me like that, right? So so they was like, uh, I need. We want you to help Cuckoo. So I flew in. I never forget it, you know. I'm a street boy, you know. Uh, my cousin Rara, Rara, you know, shout out to Rara. My cousin Rara, you know, he made sure I always kept, you know, made sure you, boy, your boy stay in J's and everything. And my my cousin E, you know what I'm saying? So, so we uh, we fly out to out to L. A. to do the show with Alicia Keys, Prince, and Blue Contrail and all of them. And so I got on some Jordans, I got on some shorts and a T-shirt, fresh off the plane, right? And then this like white dude from Tommy Boy, this little faggot dude, because Tommy Boy is a homosexual label, right? This little faggot dude was like, you're gonna have to tone it down a little bit because you're outshining Cuckoo. I'm like, man, I'm fresh off the plane. This is what I wear every day. This ain't no get up to go and perform, man. And and, and if you look at if you look at in my projects, and keep it funky, you look at in my projects, you go back to the Disturb album and you look at the cover. You'll see Cuckoo, his lip was burned on the camera, on the picture, because my man disappeared during the photo shoot to go smoke crack. And he burned his lip with the pipe. Like, for real, like, real talk. Nobody want to hear this stuff, but it's like real talk. See, I, see I, don't, I ain't in the game like that no more, so I can speak honestly because, you know, rap don't move me like that. You know, it don't, it don't, it don't feed me, and I'm, I'm a homeowner. I own property and stuff like that, so I'm not tripping off rap music, you know what I'm saying, I know a lot of broke rappers, but I'm saying like, dude burned his lip with the pipe, you know, so he was disappearing, smoking crack, and he just used to disgust me, because that was never what Infinite was set out to be, you know, and we got this crackhead representing Infinite, and he's not a gangster, I mean, he's a real nigga, I'm, I'm not gonna knock him, he's a real nigga, excuse my, my pardon me, but I'm saying, but, but, but he's not a gangster, you know what I'm saying, like, uh, He's rapping about riding on dubs and, and selling birds and all. He's a crack. I mean, a real lip burning crackhead. Like the pipe height. You know, funny, funny story. Funny story. And and Cal, I ain't dissing you, so don't 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 go there. This is just real talk, you know. But um, funny story. You know, I remember me and, me and Steve riding right. And my projects just came out right. Cuckoo Cal, local celebrity. Me and Steve ride, and we get a phone call, and they say, uh, hey, where you at? they say, uh, Steve, like, he, like, drop his head like that. I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, man, I got to go get Cal. I'm like, where he at? He like, man, he over here in the hood. We pull up, right? It's two young niggas, about 15, 16 years old, standing in front of Cuckoo with a pistol. He's sitting on the steps, right? My man pawned himself to the dope man, 
You know what I'm saying? He was like, he told the dope man, he said, my man going to bring the money. Just keep me here. And you know what I'm saying? So we had to go get Cuckoo out the pond. You know what I'm saying? We had to, we had to pull my man out the pond shop. He pawned himself to the dope boys. You know what I'm saying? And so, so, so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, you got to understand from my point. Like, I'm not, I'm not knocking them. I know, you know, I know dudes surrounded by people that, that say that's real, okay. but, you know, I come from, I come from Mr. Bill, I come from, from Small Paul and Ralph and people like that. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm around people that, that I consider to be gangsters for real, you know, live real life and everything like that. And I'm looking at, I'm like, man, yeah. this dude, it's not, it's not this dude life, man. You know okay. what I'm saying? So I was, I ain't gonna lie, I was, I was kind of like, man, I was kind of upset with the whole, the whole business. And then on top of all of that, you know. You know, also, the, you know, the stuff just, you know, just the, the, so many, borrowing so much of my ideas and all of that kind of corny stuff, you know. But, again, but with Tommy Boy, Tommy Boy was a faggot label. That was a homosexual label. You know what I'm saying? Like, like for real, them dudes was homosexual, like queers. And, um, and them dudes just used to come down and they used to be like, uh, they used to, you know, ask me to do stuff. And I'd be like, no, I'm not doing that, you know. So, you know, so they basically, on one hand, they would try to push me out of the situation. So I just kind of fell back and was like, you know, hit a brick. And, and, and to me, it did. It was like, you know, uh, what, number one song in the country, and then it sold like 60,000 copies at a time when people were selling four, five million, when people before bootlegging and all that kind of stuff. That was like horrible, you know. And... You know, so that's just the story with Tommy Boy. Tommy Boy was a gay label, homosexual dudes, ran that label. Um, with the exception, shout out, with the exception, shout out to my boy Cypher Sounds. You know what I'm saying? I will give Cypher props, Cypher Sounds. You know what I'm saying? And um, Cypher, Cypher, Cypher was cool though, it's my boy. Cypher was cool, Cypher put me on the Don't Get Gas mixtape and Cypher knew. You know what I'm saying? Cypher knew what the, where the real was coming from, so I, I shout out to Cypher Sounds because that's my man, but. And he knew it. Tom, Cypher knew that, that Tommy Boy was ran by, you know, some homosexuals, you know. Yeah, them I'm niggas say the guy was gay, though. I told him, he told him, he go, I'm gonna fuck you up here. Ran all the labels of his and shit. Hey. But with the Tommy Boy situation, um, the whole Tommy Boy situation, it really, really wasn't the direction that Infinite was going in. And, um,. My cousin Pete told me something today that I really respect because I'm a minister now and I, you know, and I'm into what I'm doing right now. And my cousin Pete told me something that I really respect. And he said, he said, Dante, he said, you couldn't, you couldn't go to that level then because, you know, we live in real life. You know, I don't understand, Twani, how people, you know, they, they on TV and they, they mention all of this stuff. And nothing happened. We mentioned that stuff and this indictment's handed out. You know what I'm saying? We live in real life. People say certain things. You was real trouble behind that. You know what I'm saying? You, you understand what I'm saying? But but see, so 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 you know, you know, people get get their real life took. Not the not the rap life, but they get their real life took. So because of that, you know what I'm saying? I'm just glad that that I'm able to back away and come back as a renewed person. You know what I'm saying? Living the life I'm living. I'm living better than most rappers in, on the charts. You know what I'm saying? I'm on a great life. Look, boy, get fat and everything. Boy, I'm telling you, I'm eating. I'm eating. I got four one k, all that kind of stuff, man. Like, dental plan, all that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? So, but anyway, that's the story with Infinite. I'm sticking to it, and y'all better not edit that stuff off funny and put it on YouTube, crazy or nothing like that either. Uh, a lot of greed. A lot of greed about nothing. That was really much about nothing to be greedy about. Cause look at where we at now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Look at where we at now. Back to square one again. <laughs> hey, if, if you can say like, uh, let's say some. First of all, let's start. Just give me some of the good things that you remember about the whole situation. The whole my projects is movement. With the Tommy Boy, you know. Uh, the best Boy part about my projects was getting paid. Boy, I never spent much money in my life. Boy, I, I was working at McDonald's at the time. Hey, man, let's put that on record. 
I was working at McDonald's before. Now, before, now I haven't worked in about 10 years now, but I'm just saying, I was literally making this band at McDonald's. But when I knew Steve O told me the deal was official, I was like, oh shit, I know how much money was got. I was like, oh shit. But you know, that, like I said, that was a good side. Now, the downside of it was like, when I spent all the money and shit, I'm talking about my side, this is my side. Uh, what I saw about. I don't know what everybody else was seeing. And I saw a lot of fake cousins come out too, but a lot of cousins I didn't know I had and boy a lot of people you know that's my you know so and so yeah. Yeah big Hank. But now a lot of y'all ain't never seen me before either, but now you see me. Now you see me. Big Hank. Man yeah it was a it was a lot of tension, a lot of a lot of heads knocking, you know what I'm saying, people ideas clashing, you know, and uh I mean Everybody wanted to, like like my guy said, you know what I'm saying, everybody wanted to be the boss, you know what I'm saying, and and not be, you know what I'm saying, play their role, you know. If a motherfucker would have played their role and people did what they were supposed to do, you know what I'm saying, we probably would still be standing strong right now, though, you know what I'm saying. I mean, not to say we down, we ain't down, you know what I'm saying, we on the uprise again, you know what I'm saying. We're like a phoenix in the fire, you know what I'm saying. You take it from the ashes, you get a beautiful phoenix, you know what I'm saying, and man, I'm telling you, it's like... Quite sure if everybody had everybody got different opinions to each just you know each person got different views. I can say I can speak for myself. I can just say I ain't gonna speak on nobody else. I'm just speak by by me. Like you know I was fucking with them drugs real tough. Between the drugs and my bad business is is where I feel like my contribution to the whole situation where it went bad. You know what I'm saying there's other parts of it. You know what I'm saying that. I feel it could have broken down, but as far as my contribution, I was fucking with them drugs, and I had, you know, bad business, man. I went on the business, man. It was just, man, I just told you, I just came from the liquor store to, man, I'm in New York recording the album, you know what I'm saying? My, man, man, night. my main thing, I think that messed it up was like a lot of chiefs, a lot of chiefs, a lot of too many, too many bosses and not enough, uh, Indians. yeah, Indians, and everybody, everybody just felt like they had the answer once we got in the door. Right. So, you know, it was like I felt like that's what kind of killed it, and uh, then everybody wanted to be stars, and it wasn't that time yet. It was my project's time, so that's what we kind of fell off with. We were all just stuck together, and it kept the momentum going. Oh yeah, we had some good motherfucking times. I bet you that. Yeah. Yeah. You understand me? We did and accomplished some, some some shit. You know what I'm saying? If I die two minutes after this interview. It's in the books, dog. We done did that, man. We did that for real, man. It's true. It was crazy that we had a Tommy Boy deal. Money got involved, so everybody wanted this and that. So I was breaking the money up, you know. I would never treat nobody less than a man. You know, Cooper got his cut, you know what I'm saying? Give him, give him a big advance off the money, you know what I'm saying? He got over 20000 out the gate. Well, no independent artist getting that kind of money independent out the gate at the time. You know, Hank got his money. You know what I mean? Everybody else they feel that she get paid, but them was, was the main two stars for me at the time to get the project going. So that's when, you know, the, the happiest top time in our life and, and the success what you drive for, you think it's happening, and he come on the bullshit, you know. I mean, the first time we got the deal, Tommy Boy calls in, we had a big meeting. So now I'm able to go up there, and uh, we had this meeting. And, you know, it's when all the snakes and shit come out. It's when you find out who's who, what's what. And uh, Kyle called us up there. We had a meeting with Tommy Boy and Cuckoo. I had a new manager there by the uh, name of Rick. And um, so Cuckoo was telling Rick one thing. So Rick being his manager had to believe what he was saying. So we get to Tommy Boy, his big table. It's me, Eddie O, all Tommy Boy staff, Smalls, and uh, Rick was sitting there. So Cuckoo first got a flight, but he didn't get on a flight. He drove up there. So he drove where all these guys. And it was crazy. So he came up there to drive. And we, so we got him on the phone. We having a meeting. We talking. And he found out everything that he was telling Rick wasn't the truth. It was just a lie. And and he was telling he came out telling the truth. Like they asked, Did you get paid? He's like, Yeah, they paid this year. So that yeah. But the thing was, I guess I don't know for sure, but I'm saying people must have gotten in his ear, was trying to get him out the contract with us, but they do their own thing. And they thought they can get all the money. But you know, we you know dumb as that went to school and everything. We got a contract, you know, but we treat people fair. And a lot of people fuck shit in this game. So we get into it about that, you know what I'm saying? He wanted, I guess at the time, he got people around him. Now, I, now all the people came with him, I ain't never seen. They ain't sold one CD out the trunk with us. They ain't record one session in the, in the studio with us. They was never around. You know, we we used to be on the road, man, at times, and Cuckoo wouldn't even come and sell his music. 
I one time my guy Jay Swiss had to act, act like Cuckoo at a show one time because he didn't show up. So we was, we did all like me, my brothers, the people these soldiers, Rabbi Gucci, or my cousin Duck, Big, man, do it to death, even do it to death was our main artist. But he we we believed in the grind so cold that he wanted to see it happen. And we were doing all this stuff ourselves. We was building Cuckoo without Cuckoo. So, you know, just to make it happen. So anything with that, so Eric, that's what all this shit happened, man. We the Tommy Boy and Shit just went haywire, man. It was supposed to be the best time of my life, but it, was, it, it went haywire. And uh, I'll tell you one of the realest moments. I remember it was in the studio recording, man. And uh, we were recording the songs. And my guys were infinite. They all went to Vegas, man, with these shirts on. And, and everybody called back, who's these guys? Who's these guys? And, you know, it was making noise. And this time, it was just me and Hank. We were putting together those songs without Cuckoo. He wasn't even in the studio with us. And we was putting these old songs, lyrics together. We was putting shit together. You know, we was working around the clock, making this project happen. And they were trying to take it from us. And you know, me and my aunt Hank was our baby. And they were trying to take it from us. And Cuckoo was trying to help them take it from us because people was feeding him whatever they was feeding, you know. And uh, but besides that, I can tell you, man, one of the most proud moments I remember of all of that is we was in the studio one time. We were working on some other stuff. And uh, Cypher, Cypher Sound took the song to the. Uh, Flex, man. Flex Master, DJ Flex, man. Flex, DJ Flex out of New York. And uh, he said, I'm going to play it tonight on, 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 hot, on Hot 94, wherever out there. He said, he's going to play it. And uh, so we all sitting around waiting for a song, waiting for a song to come on. And he played it, man. And out of my whole life, man, I never felt goosebumps before. First time I ever felt goosebumps about the music game, period, man. They playing our song. Some niggas out of Milwaukee out together, man. Some cats out of Milwaukee out together, man. They played my projects, man, on the radio and Flex, and they just played, you dropped the bomb on you. Now, when Flex dropped the bomb on you, you did, you did something, man. When Flex dropped the bomb on you, you did something. He played it, rewinded it back, and dropped the bomb on it. I was like, oh, man, I felt good, man. I felt, that's one of my comments, I felt we made it, man. Like, nigga felt like teary-eyed inside, like, it was, it was like, and we out in New York, man. At, at that time, 2000, New York was the shit, like, New York was, if you wasn't from New York, they wasn't fucking with you. And man, you in the Midwest, baby. So we got the Midwest representing the heart of the ghetto. Some young black entrepreneurs that took it to the world, man. We, and then you know, the song hit number one on the Billboard spot, man. It was, it was a beautiful thing. They ain't made the team that could their money show. Like all the cash ain't there. So I'm gonna bring the foe, but no, the half ain't there. Yeah, slickers are outfits. Yeah, niggas still out here.